G'day, Jeff. It's very nice to meet you uh, virtually all the way from Melbourne. Um, and congratulations on your book, um, Crimes Against Nature, um, which I, I read in yeah, maybe not in one sitting, but I read it very quickly. Um, I found it a, a very stimulating read and very well worthwhile. Um, oh, and it, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, mate. Well, it deserves a it deserves a wide readership. Um, so, um, why did you choose to produce this book now? Look, I think, like everyone, I'm confronting the almost existential problem we, we face now with um, climate change. And in some ways, um, global heating is now, you know, the preeminent question of our age and it intersects with almost every political issue. And so if you're someone who's interested in politics, I think you really do have to grapple with some of the issues around um, climate change. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is I think that the, the mainstream discourse around climate change gets almost everything wrong. And I don't think that that's a coincidence, but it makes it very, very difficult to even proceed towards any sort of solutions. And so what I wanted to do was to try to write a book that was as much as possible without being dishonest, an optimistic book, a book that actually suggested there is something that we can do about climate change and we are not inexorably li living through a period of, um, you know, humanity's decline. And so I wanted to make a few really simple points that I feel are, are missing from this debate. The first of which is that um, climate change is not the fault of the majority of the population. We're so often told that, that, you know, we're all responsible for this. We're lazy and we're greedy and there's too many of us and that's the reason why this is happening. And I wanted to say that was wrong. And as part of that, I wanted to say that not only are ordinary people not the problem, but they are potentially the solution. There are alternatives to the disaster that we're heading for and that um you know that that ordinary people are key to realizing those um those alternatives so that's why i wanted to write the book yeah 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 um well you've written it as um uh 13 interconnected essays so there's 13 chapters with an introduction and a conclusion um uh, each chapter can be read independently of the others um but they do flow from one to the other um, I particularly liked the way in which you wrote it as, um, as a narrative. Um, it, it's, it, I, I don't want to sound a bit twee here, but you were telling a story in each chapter, uh, unfolding a narrative. Um, so um, why did you choose that particular style and tone? Climate change is a really difficult thing to write about. Oh, it's, a, it's a really difficult issue to engage with politically for a whole variety of reasons. One reason is just that I think a lot of people now find it so overwhelming and so depressing that they don't want to engage with it at all. You know, you, you see the photos of the polar bears looking sad because there's no ice or, or whatever it is and you think, I can't deal with this. You know, I feel so hopeless. I can't. I, I can't deal with it. So that that's one of the, one problem. Uh, the second problem is that it often gets very technical very quickly, and so for a lot of people, it's just okay. They know that climate change is a thing, but they feel like it's a thing that only scientists can talk about because you know they can't understand the, the science of it. So what what I wanted to do was try to find a way to make this an engaging issue and uh, an issue that a story in which people could put themselves. And so I tried to write it around um, particular issues that I thought were important, but also particular issues where I thought you could perhaps say some things that were a little bit unexpected or a little bit contrary to what people might think you were going to say to try and make the book more engaging and more interesting and not just you know some misery porn about how bad things are going to be and yeah so that was that that was that was the basis of, of, of the book of the structure i guess was it was an attempt to try and find 
engaging ways into an issue um, because I understand full well why people turn off for it. You know, and I, I, I'm the same. Sometimes, I, you know, you see the news about some species going into extinction you think i just don't want to deal with that well mm. you know we have to deal with it and we have to find ways to 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 talk about it and i think that once you start getting engaged in a different kind of story a story in which ordinary people are not either sort of passive victims or kind of incorrigible villains but are actually potentially agents of social change it becomes a lot easier to talk about yeah yeah right Okay, so um, well, so what is the intended readership of your book? Who were you aiming it at? Yeah, it's a difficult question, isn't it? I mean, um, I wanted when I started reading re researching this book, I, I, I wanted to reach the kind of people who understand that climate change is an issue believe that is serious you know i'm not particularly interested in talking to climate denialists you know i think at this stage that you know there's not really very much to say but i wanted to talk to people who think that this is a problem but feel overwhelmed by it or feel completely demoralized by it and so i wanted to try to find a way to talk to those people and try to win some really fundamental arguments like i say fundamental arguments about what the agency is that might address this problem and what the kinds of strategies might be that might lead us to the other side because i feel that um until we tackle those really foundational issues we're going to get nowhere with this issue and you know mm. um, that's been the story of the last decades hasn't it there's been you know like so many kind of wrong strategic directions taken around climate change so many dead ends and because the clock is ticking we we can't we can't afford that anymore. So mm. what we need to do is we need to go back to first principles. We need to say, okay, what is causing this issue and what are the solutions? And, and that's what the attempt, that's what the book in its own fairly modest way tries to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the um, solutions that's being peddled at the moment is uh, electric cars. You actually take the uh, issue of car culture on head on in your book. Um, so to speak. Nice, yes. um, nice, nice pun there. Uh, so yeah, so how, where's it come from? Where does car culture come from? Yeah, so I, I, I'm gonna start, I start the book with that almost as a, as a um, little case study, because I think in some ways the question, um, when um, car culture is discussed, it's very often used as almost the um, paradigmatic case of ordinary people being greedy, and lazy and selfish and wanting their own private cars and saying to hell with the planet i'll just drive my gas gasoline car and mm. you know screw the rest the, the rest of you and that's why it's really interesting to look at the development of um the motor car particularly in the united states which is really the the foundational country for um car culture because when you look at the history the story is completely unlike the story that most of us kind of take for granted it's not a question of ordinary people selfishly demanding i want a private car it's much more a story of um actually from very early on people being quite aware of how destructive cars were and uh, resisting them in all sorts of, of ways so in the 1920s there was a um tremendous pushback to try and keep cars off the road because people saw how horrendously dangerous uh they were and like so many of the the issues i talk about in the book this was addressed by the um car manufacturers with this phenomenal pr campaign to try and normalize people to the to the notion of private cars taking over the, the, the street and as you alluded to at the start there's also this question of the um, centrality of um, the internal combustion engines responsible for, for so much carbon pollution. And again, when you look back into the development of the car, you, you just come up that right from the start, there were all kinds of other alternatives that were made uh, available, particularly um, electric cars that, you know, in the um, very early days of the, the um, 
the motoring industry in the United States were seen as, in fact, a better alternative and, in fact, were very viable in a whole series of American cities before they were destroyed for various reasons by the by the car companies. So, so, so again, I mean, I, in some ways, the, the, the story of car culture is almost uh, a, a paradigmatic example for, for the kind of argument that I, that I try to make through throughout the book that rather than people demanding these things, these things were in some ways forced upon us. And it's not, I'm not trying to suggest that ordinary people are environmental saints or anything like that, but you can see very clearly with the coming of car culture that there was a conscious and deliberate campaign by the auto manufacturers to destroy the alternatives to cars and as such to make cars essential to everybody, to most mm. people's normal lives. So they created the context in which people then started to demand cars mm. um, because cars became sort of central to people's lives. But the point is, and I think it is a really, a really um, fundamental one, this wasn't a natural process. It was a process that, that developed through a whole series of um, struggles and it could have been otherwise. So rather than people wanting these things, actually they were forced upon them. And, um, you know, had some of those campaigns been more successful, uh, you know, the, that um, the car culture we now take for granted wouldn't have come into being in, 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 in quite the way that we see it today. I thought um, I loved the quote from Raymond Williams that you've got on page 15 of your book, uh, where he points out that the notion that um, every man is a king in his car, which you know, comes from uh, Anne Rand, <laughs> um, is actually an illusion that every aspect of driving your car is actually socially conditioned. Um, do you want to talk yeah, about that, that at all? Yeah, that, 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 that's right. I mean, the, 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 the cities that we live in now were redesigned to make cars possible. Mm. And again, this was done often in the face of tremendous resistance from um, ordinary people. And once that redesigning happens, once we end up in a situation where, you know, we are living so far away from where we work and so far away from our friends and so far away from our families, cars then become kind of um, essential bait, you know. So in, in, in that sense, cars are a solution to a problem that cars create. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, um, and, and again, it's, you know, like, in some way, in some ways, it's 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 a trivial example in 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 the context of the much greater environmental problems that that we face. But it's a kind of um, paradigmatic one, and you see these same kind of debates um, playing out with almost all of the you know the the, the major issues connected with um, the environmental crisis so you know i mean i spent a great deal of time in the book talking about you know um the the, the efforts of the plastics industry to to normalize plastics in the in the face of tremendous um opposition from consumers who didn't mm. want plastic mm. um you know and actually tried to do things like um recycle their plastic bags and mm. you know in fact there was a tremendous campaign to stop people were recycling plastic bags mm. so again you know we, we're often told that you know um the problem is that the supermarkets want to stop you know all, all these plastic bags being handed out but the customers demand them actually that historically that could not be further from the truth it was exactly the opposite of way mm. way around and so what we see again and again is this tremendous slander um, that's directed at ordinary people from the corporations who are responsible for climate change, blaming us for the things that they made possible. But do you think in general that there is an unbridgeable divide between human beings and nature? Yeah, so, I mean, I think I said before that, that if we are going to... Um, get out of the environmental catastrophe that's confronting us now we have to go back to first principles and, and the most fundamental of those principles is i think trying to work through our relationship um with 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 nature so you know when i first started um 
uh, reading socialist theory was when I was at university in the uh, early 90s. And it was an era when you know, academic Marxism was dominated by a kind, a, 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 a um, well, by, by, by various kinds of post structuralist theory. And it's only relatively recently that, you know, I've gone back to some of those texts and, and realized when you're talking about um, Marx and Marxist um, economics, what you are talking about is a theory of nature and a theory of how human beings relate to the natural world. So that kind of environmental, you know, what we would talk about now as environmental attitude is actually, it's not an, it's not an additional add-on to Marxism. It's the fundamentals of the entire theory. So understanding that human beings are simultaneously part of nature, but also change nature. And as they change nature, they change themselves is I think a really kind of crucial perspective to thinking about climate change. So, you know, I, I spend a chapter for instance, talking about you know how we've got to get rid of the concept of, of wilderness the the, the the notion that there's this sort of gulf between you know human society which is in one place and the wilderness which is nature as untouched by people that lives that, that, that is outside of us and in fact you know the whole concept of wilderness is fundamentally problematic because there is almost no aspect of the natural world that hasn't been um changed by human interactions precisely because we are part of the natural world we change nature wherever we go the question then becomes not how do we avoid cha changing nature as if we could somehow step out of the nat natural world but how do we make sure that the impact we have on the natural world is a positive one and not a, a, a destructive one and i think it's a it's a really important question for um Australians in particular to, to, to come to terms with because of course we have the example of you know 40,000 years or more of indigenous civilization on the Australian continent where we have an entire culture that did not live in a wilderness as you know the old kind of um quite racist um, presentation would have it, but actually Indigenous people lived on a continent which they reshaped fundamentally by the way that they lived and the way they interacted with the natural world. The point being, however, that Indigenous culture developed over thousands of years uh, to establish methods to improve the natural um, to, to improve the ecosystems, to enable, enable animals and plants to flourish, to avoid destroying ecosystems and so on and so forth. And I think that it, 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 I mean, in some ways it's kind of obvious, but I think it's a really, really important point because it goes to this argument. Well, okay, if human beings are able to live on Australia for 40,000 years, in a society that doesn't destroy the natural world, but actually in some senses improves it, then we're, then then our species is not somehow necessarily condemned to go around destroying nature wherever we see it. It is possible for us to have a uh, more um, a more beneficial relationship with the natural world. The question is how we go about doing it. And that, I think, is, you know, is the fundamental question that we have to address. It's not that human beings are somehow a blight on the planet, that we destroy nature every time we, we touch it. That's not the case at all. In fact, we have tens of thousands of years of history that shows the opposite. But, you know, something happens, um, you know, in the modern era that, that, that fundamentally changes how we relate to nature. And that something is capitalism. Yes. And, you know, that's the problem we face. Yeah. Now, um there was an early um, cultural representation of the effects of capitalism uh, in the form of Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein, uh, which you refer to in your book. Um, what can uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein tell us about capitalism? Yeah, so that was an example of what I was talking about before, trying to find some ways to kind of take people into some of these debates. And, and, and Frankenstein is interesting well, partly it's interesting because it's a fantastic novel, but, you know, Shelley bases the novel on scientific experiments that were happening um, at the time with 
what was called galvanization, which was essentially the application of electricity to recently deceased um, animals or indeed humans. And various scientists discovered that you could apply electricity and the, and the, the muscles would, would, would twitch as electrical impulses stimulated them. One of the um, most famous of those experiments was conducted by a guy called Andrew Ewer, who um, wrote of applying a galvanic apparatus, essentially a battery, to the body of a recently executed um, criminal and making his muscle, making his arms twitch about in, in various ways. Well, it's a really kind of interesting and evocative story for a whole series of reasons, partly that the um, executed criminal was a, um, was a Scottish a Scottish weaver and this is a period when the weavers were um, engaged in um, <clears throat> really militant industrial um, struggle against the new factories that were coming into in, in, into being so you know um, Shelley was writing at a time when um, you know the that um, various in industrial activists were being executed in, in, in mass hangings all across some um, across England, but it wasn't simply that the guy that you were was experimenting on was, you know, a, a representative of the most militant um, section of the proletariat. And so there's this sort of sense in which you sees this experiment as a way of like, um, yeah, him, this uh, professor controlling the body of this, this dead, this dead, this dead uh, weaver. That's one part of the story, but of course, you are—you know—people are familiar with Marxist capital will know that name. That, that he goes on to be a um, a, a very significant um, exponent of the new ideas of of factory organisation, and you can see a direct link between his experiments with galvanisation and his attempts to control this this deceased weaver and the way he talks about how a factory should be operated which is all about the factory should be a system to control the workers mm. so it's not about productivity in the abstract sense it's about ensuring that the workers do exactly um uh, what you want them to do and the, the machinery that you have in, at, at your disposal is essentially a way of ensuring your you know your um, intelligence is the force that animates all of the people um, in your your factory and the, why that's significant to to, 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 to to climate change is it goes to this argument about how human beings relate to the natural world because what happens with the coming of, of capitalism is that um, the fundamental relationship that people have with the natural world, the way that human beings, you know, um, find enough that they can um, eat or clothe themselves or shelter themselves, which is through their interaction with the natural world, is fundamentally changed. And that interaction becomes something which is controlled by, by um, not by ordinary people, but by the logic of capitalism and the most um, the most sort of dramatic example of that, I guess, is the factory, which you are the guy who is, you know, responsible for these Frankensteinish experiments on um, a dead a dead weaver, is kind of the, the you know the the kind of founding father of this notion of the factory as a way of of, of controlling. Um, workers so again i guess it goes to this argument i'm trying to make throughout the book that rather than ordinary people being the architects of the destruction that we're seeing in the planet today that in fact the whole nature of capitalism has been about taking that control away from us and subjecting us to the the logic of capital accumulation which is about endless expansion irrespective of the human or environmental cost yeah, well, one of the things about the uh, development of the early factory system in Manchester was um, the development of uh, steam power using the burning of coal, which uh, absolutely choked the atmosphere of Manchester. Um, but it, it, as you relate in your book, it didn't have to be like that. There was an alternative before the development of steam power for 
um, the, those factories. Do you, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, yeah. So this is an argument I take from Anders Velm's um, book on fossil capital, which is um, a fantastic, um, a, a fantastic book. But you know, he he makes the point that you know we we're told this narrative that um, the steam engine is just. Uh, inexorable force that it, 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 it's a technological achievement which like which um overcomes all obstacles simply because it's more efficient and it's more productive but in fact when you look at the the history of its of its usage actually initially at least it's less effective than the other alternatives such as you know um particularly water power um which was more reliable, was more stable, was cheaper, and was more efficient. But again, the overarching reason why um, steam triumphed and why fossil fuel became so central to the development of capitalism was to do with the utility of um, steam in controlling the workforce. So there's all sorts of reasons why the more sustainable and environmental friendly sources of power such as water were less attractive for from the employer's point of view you know um one of which is simply that it was a lot easier for people to um organize in the um in the water in the, in the water powered meals than it was in this um in um steam in in, um, in factories that were powered by steam. One of the advantages of um, coal was that it was manoeuvrable, it could be taken to various places. It thus gave the employers far more power um, over their uh, workers. And that primarily is the reason why it triumphed. So, you know, there are descriptions of workers' movements marching through Manchester, um, you know, demanding stop the smoke because they saw that, you know, that the, the coal power was this hostile, force that was being used to just to prevent them organizing and to make them have to work in these ways that they didn't want to do now again it's you know I, i'm not trying to say that somehow you know the 19th century workers in manchester were some environmental paradigm uh, environmental paragons who you know foresaw um the the debates about climate change and somehow preemptively wanted to stop them. <laughs> That's not the case at all. And I'm not, you know, we, we don't have to think that ordinary people are, are saints, but the point is again and again, you see the same story that these incredibly destructive um, ways of, um, of living and of producing are enforced on ordinary people against their will. And, you know, um, Ordinary people didn't want to have to work in Manchester factories. <laughs> you know, didn't want to be choked by smoke. Didn't want to be burned alive by by boilers. And they tried to prevent these things happening. And because they were unsuccessful, well, you know, fossil capital became more and more um, important. And now we are where we are. Mm. So, again, I think it's really, really important because this claim that it's all our fault is one of the major ideological weapons of, um, of, of, of the capitalists, because if we are all to blame, then they're not to blame. You're to blame. You know, it's your fault, Barry. You did it. In your view, why is it that our politicians can't lead us out of this climate disaster? Yeah, see, I mean, I guess the fundamental argument I'm trying to make with this book is that um, there is no way out of this disaster without breaking um, the logic of the commodity, without breaking with um, the system of capitalism. So, you know, in various chapters I talk about, the nature of capitalism is that it's a system that sees every obstacle simply as um, as a way of reorganizing itself for, for further growth. It's a system that has to continually expand and has to expand blindly in an unplanned way. And I mean, as soon as you start to think about that, you, you know, you can see why the whole debate, the whole mainstream debate is so um, ridiculous because, you know, if you're committed to an economic system that must blindly expand 
every year, the GDP must grow each and every year, then environmental, um, and environmental problems are simply a matter of time. I mean, you cannot expand infinitely on a, <laughs> a finite planet unless you think that somehow capitalism is going to dematerialize itself, that somehow mm. that, um, you know, that we are going to shift away from um, the, 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 the direct effects that we have on the planet and, and develop some sort of dematerialized capitalism. And there's no evidence that that is, is happening. And, that, and that's why I think that, that actually the left has to be much, much harder on um, you know, arguments around things like green capitalism. Mm. That you know, uh, the idea that solar panels are going to save us mm. is, is a, a fantasy. Of the idea that you know, new battery technologies are going to find us, it's going to save us, uh, a fantasy. That what, in fact, if these new technologies um, take off, what we're in fact likely to see is them becoming the basis for a new round of capital accumulation around so-called green technology, which will just mean that the um, well, I mean, a few things that, well, I mean, one of the points I make in the book that is that there are, there are almost no examples of um, a new energy source supplanting an old energy source. So, you know, when, um, when um, say, you, you end up with something like petroleum displacing coal, it doesn't mean that less coal is used in absolute terms. Less coal is used in relative terms, but in absolute terms, the, um, the use of petroleum actually enables the capitalists to dig up more coal. And that's been the case with every energy shift. And there's no reason to think that it won't be the case, um, you know, e even if renewables start to become more, um, a more potent force. But at, at, at the same time, that just shifting the technological basis of a capitalist system doesn't change the fundamental dynamic of capitalism. And, you know, the environmental crisis isn't simply a question of um, climate change in and of itself. It's that, um, you know, the, 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 the ecosystem of the planet is being destroyed on, at almost every, at almost every um, level. Mm. And so, you know, a renewed um, bout of capital accumulation structure around so-called green capital isn't going to improve things. It's just going to intensify the, um, the strains that the planet is already under. And I think that's really, really important because I suspect that because people are so despairing about the potential to do anything about climate change, there will be a lot of, of well-meaning lefties who will be quite prepared to sort of, you know, like fall in behind a vision of, you know, uh, business as usual, except with solar panels instead of, you know, instead of coal. And it's not going to work. Yes. It's just not going to work, you know. Mm. I mean, so, you know, I think we have to face up. Uh, Mark says somewhere, you know, ignorance never got anywhere, anywhere, got, never got anyone anywhere. And I think that's the case with, with, with climate change. It's not going to go away if, if we close our eyes, if we, you know, um, we can't pretend that things aren't as bad as they are and we can't try to hide the fact that we need a fundamentally different system and if we don't mm. get one then you know um things are going to be really bad mm. so you know, the first step to solving a problem is recognizing the problem exists mm. so what do what do you say to the people who say that the basic problem is that there's just too many people on the planet yeah i mean so this is an old can art that comes up again and again and so you know i wanted to devote a, a, a chapter to this and and you know well in fact I, I i wrote a few chapters where i tried to address what i think are some of the some of the the, the the problems that the environmental movement has had which has meant that even though ordinary people have time and time again tried to stand up against um you know, the, the destructive um, practices that capitalism has forced upon them, they have often been quite alienated from environmentalism. I think there's a number of reasons for, 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 for that. But the argument about populationism, I think, is a particularly um, pernicious one, partly in terms of the political positions that it leads one to. As soon as one starts to say that there are too many people um, you know, 
in a particular country, then immediately one starts to one. The next question is, well, okay, who are the surplus people that we need to get rid of? And you know, the answer is always the same. It's always the immigrants. It's always the you know people of a different color. It's almost always the you know uh, people of the working class. You never get a kind of um, populationist campaigner like a Dick Smith saying, "Yes, there are too many people. Therefore, I'm going to you know top myself." You know, it's never me. I'm never the problem. It's always um, someone else. And and I think you know, in the current moment, the population arguments are particularly dangerous because we've seen already um the the, the beginnings of a of a right-wing a right-wing environmentalism so my, my previous book was about the christchurch um massacre and of course you know the perpetrator of that massacre described himself as an environmentalist and you know saw that um you know <clears throat> and and um presented his environmentalism around the notion that there are too many people who need to get rid of some of them and that's what he sort of was doing and you know if we allow the right to 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 claim this terrain then we are really are doomed you know mm. so 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 those are the political consequences but uh more fundamentally i mean the problem with populationist arguments is is that they um well they're just wrong they, they, they don't actually work um that it's entirely possible to think of you know uh, of countries and societies with large numbers of, of people that have been very, very wealthy and countries with very small numbers of people that have been very, very poor. So while obviously in a purely mathematical sense, you know, the, the earth is a finite resource and there's only a certain number of people who can physically fit on it in a purely mathematical sense, but in terms of the allocation of social resources, um, it's never a question of um, the, the, the raw numbers of people. It's always a question of how people relate to each other. And as soon as you shift that debate from how people relate to each other to the numbers of people, then, you know, you're always moving the argument to the right. And so you're, you know, always on a hiding to nothing. So, you know, it's just one of the, it's an argument that's been around forever, but I think it is one of the arguments that uh, we are going to have to face up with. And it goes back again to the, the, to the point I've been making again and again, like one of the, the fundamental um, underpinnings of populationism is, is the notion that ordinary people to blame. I mean, you know, you think of the, the, the logic of population is, is that ordinary people are to blame not for anything that they do, just by existing. There are too many people, it's your fault just by being alive. So, you know, there's nothing there's nothing that follows from that you can't do anything about being alive so you know it's, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a council of despair but it's one that that, that that points the finger at ordinary people once again yeah so look um at the end of your book and the conclusion you mentioned 12 things that people can do to solve the climate crisis i wanted to try to as i said i wanted to try and make this an optimistic book about a not very optimistic um topic and in 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 a, a political context where um the options available to people seem very very limited so you know i try to make an argument about the viability of a planned economy and why that is the the necessary solution to climate change i've just actually got a piece of the, the guardian at the moment making that making precisely that argument you know one of the real difficulties in in the way that the, the the mainstream debate about climate change proceeds is it it takes for granted the centrality of markets and so most of the arguments are based around how is it we are going to find a way to make the market make us stop digging up coals mm. you know and when you think about it like that it's utterly unhinged I mean, there's no other way in which we would say that uh, you know, rather than saying, OK, here is this thing that we know we need to do. So let's do it. We have to say, we, here is this thing that we need to do. Let's find a way to make the market make us do it. I mean, it's yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, so, so part of that part of that argument is like, well, we have to do this because, you know, the markets are the only way to organize a, a, a human society. And so. The claim I try to make is, well, that's patently not the case. And in fact, it, it's entirely possible for um, for humans to uh, deliberately and consciously decide what they produce and um, when. 
But of course, establishing a planned economy is not something that we're going to be able to do tomorrow. So I tried to sort of conclude with a few general points that perhaps people could take away in a context in which the political options available to most people are not necessarily that apparent. So I started by saying that people should be suspicious of attempts to blame the crisis on ordinary people. Now, again, I feel I've been saying that over and over again, but I think that um, it is going to be the constant refrain, refrain and it's only going to get more intense as the um, as the crisis worsens and as you know as COP, when cop 26 collapses into chaos it won't be the fault of politicians it will be the fault of ordinary people that's the way it's always presented so even in terms of you know scott morrison's um shenanigans when you read the mainstream commentary around this it's always presented this is not scott morrison's fault this is scott morrison trying to you know um trying to deal with a recalcitrant electorate you know, he wants to do the right thing, but he can't do it because of the voters. So I think we have to be really um, suspicious of any attempt to blame ordinary people without pretending that, you know, that we're all saints ourselves. But, you know, if there is any future, it lies, you know, with, with the proles, as, all, as Orwell um, said. Uh, simultaneous, simul, uh, so then I suggest that as part of that, I think that it's really important that we not allow ourselves to be guilt tripped into um, individual solutions. Again, this is the you know the long and sorry history of debates about climate change. We'll get these presentations talking about you know what's happening in the atmosphere and how many million tons of of um, of carbon are going to the atmosphere. Then the next thing will be okay, what are you doing with your recycling? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. as if these the individual choices that you will make um, will make any conceivable difference. And so. In, in, in the book, I talk about those sort of things in the way that, in fact, most of the corporations have deliberately and consciously tried to push for these kind of individual solutions like re recycling. At the same time, they have deliberately set up the recycling system so they will make no difference at all. So you can recycle as much garbage you want. It's not going to make any difference at all. Most of it just gets burned. So don't get tripped into... Um, don't get uh, don't get guilt tripped into individual um, individual arguments. I go on to say that we need to be prepared to argue. I think that's one of the weaknesses of the left at the moment is that um, because we've been isolated for so long, a lot of us are not actually very good at persuading other people. So you know, like recognizing that we're in a minority, we have to start um, prosecuting these arguments and learning ways to make them palatable to other people. So neither pandering to people who disagree with us, nor hectoring them. Trying to meet people where they're at and trying to persuade them, which is easier said than done, but it's what we have to do. Um, at the same time, we have to expect that we are going to face opposition, that um, we are talking about a, um, a struggle for the fate of the planet. The stakes are really high. The, um, you know, the, the moment we start to make um, any gains, we need to expect that there will be tremendous opposition. We, we saw briefly with, you know, Extinction Rebellion and the, um, the crackdown on them as so one form that that will, will take. But, you know, you're not going to be popular making um, anti-capitalist arguments around um, climate change. You're just not. So we have to expect that we are going to face opposition. I'm just trying to make sure. Um, and the other points, look, I won't go through them all. The other points are in terms of trying to find collective solutions, trying to find ways to organise locally, trying to find ways to organise um, in your workplace, Re trying to um, retain a degree of hope in a situation that we know, while it is extremely serious, will throw up opportunities. And we've seen them over the past year. We've seen, you know, I made the point that, you know, the demonstrations around Black Lives Matter were the biggest demonstrations ever in human history. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that there hasn't been, you know, moments of, of, um, of, of breakthrough. And then at the same time, I think that it's really important that we should expect the unexpected. We're living through such an, an unstable period at the moment um, and that the forms that resistance will take can't be predicted in advance, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, on, you know, look, on the one hand, we knew that um, the environmental disaster would lead to all kinds of catastrophes, but who predicted COVID? Mm. 
Mm. You know, actually, when you look back at it, there are various scientists who are saying that this is something that could happen. But you know, like nobody predicted the, the, how the last few years would 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 play out. Well, that's what the future is going to look like. We should expect that. Mm. You know, the next year we, there is no return to normal now. Mm. You know, that that's COVID might might ease or whatever. But we are in a period where you know, if the science is correct, we should expect intensified natural disasters, one form or another, whether that is bushfires or floods or heat waves or whatever it's going to be mm. and the opportunity the political opportunities that that, that 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 might emerge from those are hard to predict and so we need a certain degree of flexibility to be able to um adjust to those and you know yeah and to retain a degree of hope to 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 um you know these are serious times but um we have the tremendous resource that our side is infinitely bigger than their side that the 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 proportion of the planet who has an interest in overcoming climate change is far far larger far far more significant than the proportion of a planet of the planet who has an interest in pushing for you know continued ecological destruction and that at least should be a source of some hope mm. okay look i want to thank you for producing this book um, and I have a, a small list of people who I'm going to buy copies for, for Christmas. Um, oh. and yeah, <laughs> mate, it, 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 because, um, I've been involved in so many conversations about climate change you know, with all sorts of people. Um, I mean, God, every day at work. Um, so, and this is a, a very readable introduction to a set of ideas that a lot of people have not had contact with in their lifetime. Um, I think it's a very valuable book and uh, I really thank you for producing it. And thank you for thank taking you the time for... to talk to Green Lamp. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation and thank you for your support, Barry. <laughs>